So it would be interesting for us to see if ChatGPT can pick up the uniqueness of certain groups and give them justice, knowing that, as you mentioned, that there was an active genocide to destroy these cultures. So, and destruction of the cultures in the modern digital age happened with shadow banning, with, you know, producing, like not letting people like you publish or produce or, or put things in the, on the internet which means that less of this content is being used to train these large language models, which means that the issues of discrimination and race, ChatGPT is the entire internet as a data set, as a training model. And basically the louder your voice is, the higher you rank in the, in the mind of these machines. Like if, if the, cause, Remember that the essence of this technology is autocomplete. So if you're writing a Gmail and say, I'm walking my blank, the, the algorithm behind the scenes is looking at what is the highest probability word that comes after I'm walking that. Now, with their data set, you've got hundreds of millions of people saying, I'm walking the dog, the powerful usually likes to destroy the, um, the weak. Um, and, and I think it, it took us as humanity a lot of evolution to start realizing that when you destroy a, a community, you're actually um, destroying a part of you. And I think, um, you know, right now, I feel that there, there is a movement of preserve, preservation, but maybe it's not as good enough. Maybe we always, there's always room to improve, but I kind of like have the analogy, it looks like that you, you would, you know, our, our current situation as a human being is that, okay, if we are powerful, we would show mercy and we would preserve communities only if our own benefit is not touched. It's, it's kind of like when we are, we, we want to build a house. I think capitalism right now is playing another arguably destructive role, even in the AI race, because the same reason is that because we have a capitalistic global economy, uh, competition is rampant and then you cannot put any guardrails on, on these technologies, even if they are destructive to humanity, potentially. So what if AI not only comes up with plans and models for that that are more effective, but also um, in the sense of war or whatever, would think, um, well, this is what we would do to see that objective. And I know that was way back at um, the 1970s. And so later on, one of the presidents of the United States to remain supposedly a political, I won't mention which one, um, who had been in the service and so on, uh, began to consider the, uh, the possibility of, based on their earlier experience, that you had a winnable nuclear war. And I'm like looking at this, but nobody wins in a nuclear war, right? Um, so it's a little bit like climate change. We had a conference and we were some of the people that forced that discussion. Um, and they've admitted there was a, there was a genocide from 1850 or earlier uh, to at least 1870, and it was a powerful, powerful genocide by law, ordered by the governor with the support of the United States government. And as that has gone, they've done a huge mea culpa, right? Well, if we use that as, a, and so that's all happened. You can find copies of the reports in 2021 uh, that they've come up with. So it's completely changing the paradigm right here within the state of the United States of America. The genocide was a critical part uh, of the creation of the, uh, of the country. So in California, the perfect case, of what was true, I believe, I think my work looks at this a lot, because we believe, first of all, in this country. First of all, we used to believe, I used to work for the People's Republic of China, believe it or not, uh, besides on a lot of native reservations and in the Caribbean. And um, so we used to believe that capitalism could only happen in democratic societies. And it also depended on two things, um, competitiveness, uh, you know, free willing competitiveness connected to the other kinds of things called free markets. And I've done a lot of work with world systems people. And I, I think I'm going to ascribe something to him that he may not take full credit for, but the great Emmanuel Wallerstein, who passed away a few years ago, used to go, well, free markets. Well, where are the free markets? There are no free markets. Free markets. All systems and large corporations tend toward monopolism and tend to destroy their, their competition. So the, first of all, there's not free markets. We cannot turn off our um, fossil fuel system in our extractive economies uh, because other economies will continue. And we like to think of China right now. We can think of the Cold War, uh, economically probably not the same um, as Russia, the Soviet Union. You know, or who knows what will be next week, right? We can't do that. And so the same thinking uh, is driving us to the brink of destruction. And how could we keep that out of AI? I don't know if there's a clear answer there. 
Uh, but as you pose it there, um, we, whoever the we is, but we within the so-called Western world, the United States and Europe, that like to think that we have these moral positions now, um, we feel we have to stay competitive with other other places and societies. In this case, as you just brought up China, who, yeah. who can turn this stuff off or control it? I we guess... can't do it in climate change, so I don't know why we'd be able to do it in terms of global knowledge. Because we believe, first of all, in this country, first of all, we used to believe, I used to work for the People's Republic of China, believe it or not, uh, besides on a lot of native reservations and in the Caribbean. And uh, um, so we used to believe that capitalism could only happen in democratic societies. And it also depended on two things, um, competitiveness, uh, you know, free willing competitiveness connected to the other kinds of things called free markets. And I've done a lot of work with world systems people. And I, I think I'm going to ascribe something to him that he may not take full credit for, but the great Emmanuel Wallerstein, who passed away a few years ago, used to go, well, free markets. Well, where are the free markets? There are no free markets. Free markets. All systems and large corporations tend toward monopolism and tend to destroy their, their competition. So first of all, there's not free markets. I call them vision and indigenous models for global climate change in the Anthropocene. Um, and so what would a Lakota Dakota, or what would a Quichua out of, let's say, Ecuador or, or Peru look like, right? What would uh, a Mapuche ver version of the world look like? Um, what would here, you know, maybe um, one of the California Indian peoples, either the Cahuilla or the Chumash, right? What would that world look like, right? But if our knowledge has destroyed much of that, if our system has destroyed most of that, it's like we can't produce that kind of knowledge. And at that point in time is when I didn't do a lot with it, but I began to question if we ourselves, we were some of the first to publish on the genocide in California, the Professor Cliff Trafser from UC Riverside and myself and the American Behavioral Scientist, uh, before Madley and all that got his book, which didn't really acknowledge us that he gets very famous for out of UCLA, American Genocide. So they go, well, what about societies or indigenous societies you know, have a great deal of influence. And they went to, um, you know, Peru and Ecuador, and, and, but especially Bolivia because of, you know, a, a short-term um, leadership by indigenous societies. Well, that's the problem. Those nation states are in fact colonial constructions. So ultimately each one of them, whether it's, you know, Korea and others in, um, in Ecuador, uh, said, if you're not going to help us offset our non-development in the upper Amazon, uh, then we'll just have to sell the rights.